Hi everybody, my name is Jacob Cardinal Tremblay. I'm a physics major here at WVU, and today I'll be talking to you a little bit about my research, which involves the optimal frequency channelization for pulsar dispersion measurements. So let's start with pulsars. Pulsars are neutron stars. So when a star reaches the end of its life, it'll get really, really big, and then it'll go supernova, and then it'll collapse into this tiny remnant uh, that is a neutron star. And this neutron star is going to be extremely dense. It's going to be about the mass of the sun into the size of Morgantown. And you can see, uh, as the demonstration shows on the right, that if you start with a big, big star that's spinning slowly, if you compress it down to being really, really small, then it'll start spinning extremely fast once, once it gets to that size. And this is where pulsars come in. So pulsars are neutron stars that are spinning really, really fast and that are emitting radio waves. So some neutron stars are going to be emitting radio waves, and they'll, the radio waves will pass in front of us, in front of the Earth, uh, in seconds or millisecond periods, so extremely, extremely fast. And it'll create a sort of lighthouse effect where we'll see that signal every once in a while. Um, they're all, these signals are also extremely, extremely precise. Um, and we can know exactly when, the, when they're going to be arriving uh, to an insane amount of accuracy. Um, because of this, they can act as cosmic clocks, and that allows us to test all sorts of science, and they're, they're really, really interesting uh, properties. And as you can guess, uh, these pulsar signals are detectable here on Earth by a bunch of different radio telescopes. Uh, for our project in general, uh, for the research that we're doing here at WVU, uh, the three main telescopes we're using is the Green Bank Telescope, the Arecibo Telescope, and the CHIME Telescope. So these are all really interesting telescopes because they all have uh, their own mechanisms of working. Uh, the Green Bank Telescope is a 100 meter dish and it's actually steerable. And this one's really cool because it's actually located in West Virginia. Uh, the Arecibo Telescope can't move, uh, but it does have a steerable receiver so we can look at different points in the sky. Uh, and it's located in Puerto Rico, but unfortunately this one collapsed uh, not long ago. Um, and they're looking to rebuild that one. Uh, the CHIME telescope is a new telescope that was built very recently in British Columbia. Uh, it is four 20 by 100 meter half cylinders, and it's basically a drift scan telescope. So you can't really point it uh, the same way that you can with the other telescopes, but it'll look at the whole entire sky above and get data from that. Nanograv is the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Uh, it is a pulsar timing array, and pulsar timing arrays time pulsars from all over the galaxy, and they create a sort of array, as you can see in that bottom right picture there, which is sensitive to all sorts of changes in space and time. Uh, and their goal, Nanograv's goal, is to detect gravitational waves from the signals that we receive from pulsars. These gravitational waves are actual disturbances in space-time. So these were predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, and they were actually recently discovered uh, for the first time by LIGO, which is a different type of uh, instrument that's based on Earth to detect gravitational waves. Many people also call gravitational waves the future of astronomy. Uh, this is because uh, as a gravitational wave passes through the Earth, it's actually undisturbed from, its act from the source that it came from. So this is completely different to normal light that we're used to. Normal light gets blocked by uh, any object that comes in front of it or changed or altered in many ways, uh, gravitational waves do not. So it provides us with important information directly from the source. Um, these uh, gravitational waves can come in a whole large amount of spectrums, uh, and it can help us detect anything from colliding neutron stars, supernova, uh, compact binaries, to uh, colliding galaxy mergers, and uh, a bunch of other things. So this is really going to be very important for astronomy in general. Um, there's also, there's going to be a bunch of different tools that we can use to detect gravitational waves. The only gravitational waves that have been confirmed to be detected have come from LIGO, which is the Earth-based interferometer. Um, but they're also planning on building a space-based interferometer, which is going to be kind of like lasers in space, which is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, and there's our pulsar timing, which is very interesting as well. And that's going to be detecting gravitational waves from colliding galaxies. And yeah, so there's a lot of different uses for gravitational waves, and they're going to be very important to the future of astronomy.
so let's get into a bit of the science of our actual project. Our project looks at errors in dispersion measure. So dispersion measure is the integrated column density of free electrons along a line of sight to a pulsar. Uh, they're described by these two equations right here. And it's basically the amount of material that's between us and a pulsar, the amount of electrons that's between us and a pulsar. Um, it'll, we can detect it and we measure it because uh, signals that arrive at higher frequencies are gonna arrive faster than they do or earlier than they do at lower frequencies. So you can see that right picture um, that the, the signals from the higher frequencies up here are gonna be arriving much earlier than the ones at lower. And the bigger this, this change, the, the bigger the, the dispersion, dispersion measure is. We also note that dispersion measure variations are really important to study. Um, this is what you see in the, the bottom plot right there. And we're using a simulator, the Pulsar Signal Simulator, which was developed by Brent Shapiro Albert when he was a doctoral student here at WVU. Um, he created a Python pass package to model realistic Pulsar signals. Um, this is really, really uh, a really good device because it's able to simulate emission, propagation effects, uh, data processing artifacts. And it's it was made with the goal of simulating sources of error, which is exactly what we want to do in our project here. It's a, it was made with the goal of simulating um, ISM, which is the interstellar medium uh, effects. So this is something that the D DM actually is. Uh, it can simulate a pulsar noise emission mechanisms and even gravitational waves. So a bunch of so sources of errors like that that we want to take a look at. Uh, so it's really an ideal um, device or Python package for what we want to do. Um, it can also simulate instrumental noise, so like radio frequency interference, uh, radio mod, ra radiometer noise, backend sampling effects, all sorts of stuff. So it's really applicable. We can really run it through the amount of any amount of error that we we need to, and uh, it can also be used to assess a sensitivity of search algorithms with simulated signals. Um, so it's really, really useful. Um, this right plot right here is an example of a simulated pulse profile where the pulse actually changes at different frequencies. So it's able to not only just simulate a signal, but it can change that signal depending on the frequency and it can give us actual results of what we think uh, it should uh, signal should look like from an actual pulsar. So depending on different pulsars, it'll it'll be able to simulate exactly that signal from that individual pulsar, and it'll be able to give us a really, really good look at uh, what errors we should be expecting. And it's really a great tool for exactly this type of project that we're doing right now. And the actual goal of this project is to look at the frequency channels and how the number of frequency channels changes our data. So, um, we can initially take, say we initially take the data with 2048 frequency channels. Um, before we actually process any of that data, we're gonna wanna uh, compart compartmentalize some of that data into a, a specific number of channels so that it looks better and it reduces our error. Um, so if we look at the lower number of frequency channels in the bottom here, you can see that uh, the, the plot at the bottom left with four channels is a very, very bright. Um, but as we move towards the right, that brightness is going to decrease, but we also get gain a lot of resolution. So uh, this is the actual dilemma that we have where we want to look at the signal to noise and the resolution and have a good mix between both where the we reduce the amount of error in the dispersion measure um, measurement. So uh, as we increase the higher number of frequency channels, we're going to be losing a lot of resolution or a lot of signal to noise. And then as we decrease the number of frequency channels, uh, we are going to be making the signal to noise go up, but we're losing a lot of resolution. So uh, that's basically the really the real goal of this project. Uh, this data that you see here is actually real data. So for, for this one, I think the peak is around 64 channels where we have the lowest number of error in frequency channels. 
where that mix is just right. Uh, but that'll change depending on the pulsar and the frequencies and everything. So it's really important that we take a look at all this. So how do we actually do it? So first we select a pulsar from the Nanograv 12.5 year data set. These are all pulsars that have been uh, timed very well and that are very reliable. So we, we want to start with those. And we also want to look at these pulsars because we are, our ultimate goal is also to help Nanograv. So we select the pulsar depending on brightness, or available data or any of this, eventually we'll be going through the whole list though. So um, we'll do that. And then after that, we'll be going through and looking at uh, the properties that we want to look at. So what frequency do we want to look for at and which telescope do we want to use? Uh, although this is all simulated data, it's still important to have the right uh, aspects for this. And uh, the, the pulsar properties is going to change uh, depending on the, the frequency and the telescope and all this. So we want to make sure we have that uh, good. So then after that, we, we run our simulator with those properties, and that's going to give us the TOA, so the time of arrivals of the pulse. So this is, this is, is the simulated data that we get, and it basically tells us when we're uh, getting the signal. Um, so this is simulated data, and basically normally we would get have real data like this, uh, but this is all fake, but it's very reliable. So then after that, we will uh, run this data through a software called Pint, uh, which we use to then find the dispersion measure value, and it gives us the error as well. And then this is what gives us, uh, it gives us our final results there of the, um, where we can look at the number of frequency channels and see which one gives us the lowest error. As for our results, currently most of our time has been spent on the methodology and creating a working system that's going to really work for all these pulsars and we can run it through once we get everything working right. Uh, but we do have results for a pulsar, which is uh, J1713 plus 0747. Um, this pulsar uh, is actually quite peculiar because uh, as we look at that bottom left plot right there, you can see that the error basically just diminishes as a um, as we increase the number of frequency channels. And for now, we're, we expect that that might be just because this is one of Nanograv's brightest pulsars. So maybe because it's so bright, the signal to noise is actually um, still realistic for such high value of number of frequency channels. Um, and we expect that too, because the time of arrivals are acting as expected, uh, as we can see on the right plot, which is a logarithmic type of um, uh, is what is what we expect to see uh, in the time of arrival and the number of frequency channels. So, uh, and we're our next steps are to be moving on to pulsar J1918 minus 0642, and we should have the results for that pulsar shortly. And this project will actually have a pretty important contribution to science. Uh, this is because it can help us understand uh, what reduces the errors in dispersion measure. And uh, most importantly, it'll help scientists know how many frequency channels to use. So uh, right now, a lot of the times we're using the best approximation or best guess just because uh, the data isn't extremely clear on which what the best number of frequency channel, channel is to use. And especially for new telescopes like the CHIME telescope that you can see a picture of in the bottom left there, um, that's a new telescope and the exact properties of the instrument aren't uh, complete, haven't been completely studied yet. So any uh, increased studies or anything to help them with their own studies is going to be really important, uh, especially as, uh, or if we want to use any of that information in uh, gravitational wave studies that need to be extremely precise, and we really need to know what's going on with, with that data. So any, any of the, if we can decrease any error in this dispersion measure, it's going to be really, really important. Um, also, uh, this will be a lot of help to dispersion measure variation studies, which do uh, help with the detection of gravitational waves, the eventual detection. Um, and that's what the plot in the bottom right is right there. Uh, you can see that this is actually the, some of the real data that we looked at uh, when I did a pulsar dispersion measure variation study uh, earlier this year. And with a real pulsar, we do the same thing. Uh, but now we're doing all that with a simulated pulsar to have a good idea of where to start. And thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and please uh, send me a message if you have any questions at all.